to be with y'all here today. I've been talking about this for a long time. I'm so happy to get started. We're talking about the gut. Um, I wanted to just say that I'm a big fan of ancestors. You're probably going to hear me say that word a lot, ancestors and elders. Um, I have some information here. I have my business card and a couple of flyers. So if you all decide that you want to speak more about this work with me later, I would love to talk more about what we're speaking about today. And again, understand we're going to talk a lot about our history, our ancestors and elders. And I say that so often because a lot of what we learn is from them and through them, what they've passed down generationally. And I want to make sure that we're honoring that. So when I speak later and we speak about how do we have healthy guts, a lot of that comes back to what did your ancestors do? Because that generally is the answer of what works best for us. Okay, so what, the one last thing I wanted to say is I'm a part of a collective because I believe in full spectrum health and healing. And this conference is just perfect because we heard about so many modalities today. And I actually work with people who practice many of these same modalities, including the EFT tapping. So um, I would love to continue working with you all even after this conference is over. This is what we're going to talk about today, starting with probably the most obvious, what is the gut? Can you all point out to me where the gut is? There you go. Starting here, all the way down. That's right. So when we talk about gut health, it's, it's difficult because this happens a lot with water. What is the healthiest form of water? What do y'all think? Any ideas? I'm surprised I haven't heard anyone yell out alkaline water. I always hear this in every talk I give. Your water needs to be alkaline. Your food needs to be alkaline. Your girlfriend needs to be alkaline. <laughs> Everyone needs to be alkaline, right? And here's the issue, is when you go too far one way or the other, we get in trouble. We're talking about pH balance now, right? One side of the spectrum is acidic, the other side is alkaline. Neither are good. I'm a Libra. I'm all about balance. I love balance. So we're going to talk a lot about that today. It was called homeostasis. So when we are shifting today, I want to talk about what's called incremental change. If we're doing what we consider to be wrong or inaccurate for too long, we can't expect you to do the complete shift opposite because it won't work. So incremental change will probably be the most important thing we do with whatever shift and change you do in your life. One last thing I want to say about this is in terms of food. I heard someone mention this earlier, the SAD diet, standard American diet. <laughs> the standard American diet, the SAD diet, is mostly what? It means we're mostly consuming what? Carbohydrates. Now, here's the thing. The name of the game is inflammation. If you want to heal your gut, we need to take away inflammation. Why is this so important? When you eat too many carbohydrates, it raises your blood what? Blood sugar. Now, if you exercise, like our ancestors, I told you to talk about ancestors today, if you exercise like our ancestors from morning to night, it doesn't matter how many carbohydrates you eat. We do not move like our ancestors, however, which means your body has to release insulin to lower your blood sugar. Y'all with me so far? Here's the difficult piece. Two things happen when you release insulin. Number one, you stop burning fat. Now this is big for people who are trying to lose some weight. Because in my classes, I don't talk about weight loss, I talk about fat loss. Weight loss can be muscle, bone, blood, water, fat. Say that one more time. Muscle, bone, blood, water, and fat. Now, we don't want to get rid of the first four, right? We want to get rid of fat. But you literally cannot burn fat when your body releases insulin. That's one piece. Here's the second piece. If you chronically release insulin, you release inflammation. Now, I told you all the name of the game is inflammation. And I'll show you how and why soon. But here's the problem. What happens when you have a standard American diet where we are eating carbohydrates all day long? 
That means, number one, you haven't burned fat all day long. And number two, you have lots of inflammation. Here again is the gut. Starts from the top, goes to the bottom. I've heard people say that this is your second brain. I'm not convinced this isn't your first brain. Have you ever noticed that a sick person, it seems like they go out of their way to sneeze on you? It's like the bacteria just can't wait to flourish and go everywhere that it can. Same thing happens with your gut. So when you eat too many bad food, bad quality food, um, processed foods, fast food, you have lots of bad bacteria, negative bacteria in your gut. When you have an overflow of negative bacteria, they release a lot of things. One of those is called NPY. NPY releases and goes to your brain and it makes you hungry, not just a little hungry, but like the cookie monster. So we're fighting this NPY all day long. All day long you're fighting this and for the most part we're winning until midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, you're up at night. Are you trying to eat a salad at one o'clock in the morning? <laughs> what, are we, what are we normally eating? I didn't hear, what was it? <laughs> ice cream, ice cream and salad, right? Have you all noticed that Subway is now open 24 hours a day? Do you think that it's because they love you and care for you and want to give you more food at 1 o'clock in the morning? The two things that your gut feeds off of is sugar and yeast. What are the two things that we're craving late at night? Sugar and yeast. So is it you that's in charge right now or the gut? Here's an interesting fact. There's about 100 trillion bacteria cells in your body. Think about that number. I'm actually teaching my daughter right now numbers. There's tens, hundreds, thousands. When did you get to millions, billions, and then trillions? There's 100 trillion bacteria cells in your body. There's only 10 trillion human cells, 65% of which is blood, which means you are not mostly human, you are mostly bacteria. So again, the question is, who's in charge? So now I have another big question for y'all, which is, can you tell me some of the good bacteria? What is it called? Probiotics. What are some examples of probiotics? Yogurt. Kimchi. I heard someone say kombucha. Look at my wife just brought me. Here's some power greens kombucha. There's lots of different types of probiotics. Luckily, I haven't heard anyone say capsules yet. We'll talk about capsules at the end. But here's the thing. Probiotics are great for you, but they need a little bit of help. So I like to think of it like this. Who is this? This is not Superman, Clark Kent. This is Clark Kent. Now imagine if you have, there's basically a civilization going on in your gut right now. Right now at this moment, everyone in this room has another civilization existing, it's in your gut. Now if you were trying to fight a war in your gut, would it be helpful to put in, how many billions do they give you when you eat those capsules? 500 quadrillion probiotics. Would it be great to put in 500 billion Clark Kents just by himself, which is like these? I forgot to say a couple of different things. Number one, I do not work for Trader Joe's or Sprouts, nor will I make money <laughs> if you all shop at Trader Joe's or Sprouts. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I wanted to say is if y'all want to take pictures, please, please do. Um, there's a lot of information I put up here, and I doubt you're going to remember something like Lactobacillus ruteri. So if you want to take a picture, please do. The reason I have the slide up is just to let you know that there's hundreds, hundreds of different types of probiotics out there. And every time you consume different types of probiotic rich foods, you're getting a different probiotic because they all have different functions. That's a big piece today. If you have something going on inside the body, something going wrong, you need a specific type of probiotic. Today we're talking about mood disorders. So we're going to be talking about things that helps the mind specifically. Now, Clark Kent gets stronger with what? Do you remember? That's right. Finally. I've been asking people this forever. Nobody knew the answer. The, the yellow sun. The yellow sun for probiotics is called prebiotics. If you have the two together, it will be exponentially stronger. What are some examples? 
Y'all ever eat your bread, your sandwiches on rye bread? Sprouts, the store that I do not work for, nor will I make money if you shop at it. Sprouts sells a delicious bread called Alvarado Street Bakery. It's sprouted, it's organic. If, if white bread spikes your blood sugar this high, sprouted bread spikes it way down here. They have a sprouted rye bread as well as sourdough, which is nice. Jicama is one of my favorites. I typically don't drink kombucha by itself. I'll have some jicama with me. I'll have akasha in the morning. I have, you saw a kefir was on the board. Y'all know what kefir is? I had kefir in my protein shake, but I also had a scoop of akasha inside. Akasha is one of those things that I want to talk about a lot because there is no be all end all for everyone. There is no just one thing. Everyone take this and you will feel better. Many of us, when we take fiber, and all these are fibrous foods, many of us, when we take fiber, we actually have an upset stomach. It gets worse. SIBO, leaky gut, diverticulitis, Crohn's, colitis. You've heard of these things before? This is the best thing you can do for your gut unless you have all of those things I just said. And unfortunately, every year that goes on, more and more people are getting those. Fortunately, we have a little bit of help, and one of those helps is akasha. Akasha is one of the only prebiotic foods that we can continue to eat even with those gut disorders. However, make sure that you are working with your healthcare professional when you try something new. Everyone heard me say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> just making sure. So what happens when you don't just have your kombucha? What happens when you put them both together? You will get Symbiotics. This is Superman. So now we're going to get a little deep. Y'all ready for all this? You're awake? All the moving around kept you up? OK, here we go. We are going to think about this gut to brain connection as a freeway. If the freeway is open, you probably don't live in LA. <laughs> you probably live anywhere but here, or UC Davis. They call it under construction, Davis. It's always something they're working on. If your freeway is open, these are the people that it seems like, I don't know if you remember in the video, the woman said, I don't know why it seems like I'm sad all the time. It seems like my behavior is always off, but other people seem to have their act together. Part of that is that they are just faking it. But the other piece could be that the freeway is still open. Pain perception, you're supposed to be able to feel pain because pain helps you understand when something is wrong. Another piece is when your freeway is still open, you still have normal gut function, meaning you can still pass food properly. I had someone ask me, am I supposed to have a bowel movement every week? What I heard them say was every day. I thought they said every day. So I was like, yeah, you should have a bowel movement every day, every couple of hours even. And they said, no, 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 I said every week. What is wrong? Why are they struggling so much to have a bowel movement every single week? That means that the freeway is not open. Something, the four or five, they're probably driving on the four or five. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't have to drive on the four or five anymore. So this disruption of flow comes from so many different things, but it can definitely come from things like C. jejuni. Campylobacter jejuni, another one is H. pylori. Y'all ever heard of H. pylori before? That seems to be the most popular, H. pylori. We get the two confused with each other often. These things come in when you change baby's diapers and you don't use gloves. Um, you have raw or not very cooked meat. If you cook food and just leave it on the table and say, oh, I'll come back later, and you come back and touch it again, these are usually when we get these types of infections. This type of negative or bad probiotics can shut down your freeway. There is help out there. And just as I told you before, that there are specific probiotics for specific things. They're not just all good for everything. The first one I want to bring up is something called Bifidobacterium breve, B-R-E-V-E. -E. I'll talk about it again because this is one of the, the game changers. Bifidobacterium breve. So here's the next piece, anxiety. There are beneficial and non-beneficial bacteria as much as possible. I don't want to call the non-beneficial bacteria bad or negative. We'll call it non-beneficial. 
When you have all of it together, that makes up what we call the gut microbiota. It's not just beneficial, it's not just negative, it's a combination of both. And you wanna have a good balance as much as possible. When does your gut start to form? The microbiota, any ideas? Preconception, preconception. How are the parents eating? Do the parents have anything happening with their gut? Because guess where it's gonna to go to next? And then after that, what happens when the baby is inside? And then the last piece is afterwards, once they come out. So we call this the indigenous gut microbiota. When the baby first comes out, what bugs, what bacteria is already inside? A lot of this is determined by who touches the baby first. And a long, a long time ago, it was either the doctor or the nurses touching the babies. Now you see that they have gloves. I'm actually very happy they have gloves because I would like that first person to be me because I take care of my gut. Does that make sense? What's the first thing that happens afterwards? They take the baby out and then what happens? I hope so. Put it to the mother's chest. I'm a big, firm believer in breastfeeding. I kind of have to be right now. My wife does breastfeeding work and childbirth work. But even if she didn't, I would still be a big, 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 firm believer. And I'm going to tell you all why in a second. If you look at some of the things that happen when the baby is, uh, is exposed to too many negative bacteria from the time they come out of the womb, anxiety, depression, autism is a spectrum, so it can be anywhere on that spectrum, um, and even schizophrenia, which we're going to talk about later. All these things start from the moment the baby comes out of the womb. Another piece that we talk about a lot is anxiety and social anxiety. If your baby is born very low weight, they have a greater chance of not being put to the breast. Now, I bring that up for a very specific reason. We know that the mo more inflammation a baby has, we know that the less good bacteria a baby has, the more that they are at risk for everything I just showed you, including anxiety. One really amazing, beautiful piece showed that the babies, the newborns who were born, who were immediately put to the breast, immediately had less anxiety at that moment and also later in life. We could even predict how much social anxiety they would have once they became older, based on if they were fed um, human mother's milk or not. Colostrum is one of the big reasons that this happens, but it's also the microbiota on the skin itself of the nipple. This is why I'm such a huge believer in breastfeeding as opposed to just using a bottle, which doesn't have any of those things. Does that make sense? Something else that can happen with these babies is chronically inflamed gut, leaky gut. Leaky gut is something that's been throwing around a lot today these days. IBS is another one of those. Uh, food allergies. How in the world is it possible that we are allergic to actual food? Nuts, pineapple, how did that happen? These things begin from birth. What is happening in the gut? Same with skin diseases, skin disorders. It's all tied together. Here's a difficult piece. When the baby is very, very low weight, where are they typically taken? The NICU. Are they given mother's milk? Are they put on the mother's breast? We're setting these babies up for failure, unfortunately. So let me say one last piece before I move forward. Your body wants to heal. Your body, your brain, it wants to get better. It just needs our help in doing so. So what I want to say is even though this seems doom and gloom right now, I promise it gets better. And it's the reason I do this work. I think it's so beautiful how well the body can heal. We just need to give it some help. So don't think that it's over, even for these babies born very low weight. Fair? OK, so the next piece then I want to talk about stress. Y'all have heard about stress before. I have a quick video. It's only two minutes talking a little bit more about stress. Before I show you, I did want to say that one great piece about stress is if it's small or acute stress, meaning it's not that big, not happening very often, it's actually good for the body. Stress causes resiliency. I'm a big fan of resiliency. It's the reason we're here today. Our ancestors were very resilient. However, the question is what happens when it becomes chronic?
Watch this. One little piece of paper can have a remarkable effect. Stress is stressful. But if you understand a bit about what it is, you'll be better able to deal with it. First, though, take a few deep breaths. In fact, do that any time you feel stressed. It helps. Stress is a survival mechanism. When danger appears, it can get you out of trouble quickly. Your body crashes up the gears and throws all its resources into getting you moving. Your heart pumps furiously to increase blood pressure. Glucose is sent to the muscles as a fuel injection. And you become totally focused on what psychologists call fight or flight. Thing is, this emergency state is only meant to last just long enough to get you out of danger. But here in the 21st century, we stress about different things, and for much, much longer. Your brain and body stay on red alert, and you'll be less able to think clearly, learn, or remember things. Take a few more deep breaths, because as you now know, stress is a physical reaction, and deep breathing helps to counteract its effects. So, what else can you do? Okay, top tips to reduce stress. First, get plenty of exercise. Let out all that locked up energy. Now, back to the problem. Get in control. Scope out the situation and how you're going to tackle it. Don't stress alone. Talk to someone. Socialize and have a laugh. You can't laugh and quick with fear at the same time. Get down with nature on a big or small scale. And if your mind won't stop worrying, give it something else to do instead. I think I've seen that video at least a hundred times and I still smile at that last scene every single time because it's something I love to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. So I don't know if you all, have you all seen this part of the brain yet? Hippocampus, the amygdala, prefrontal cortex. So it's different levels of the brain. The reason I want to talk about this is when you think about the brain stem, bottom part of the brain, this is the fight, flight, freeze that y'all have heard about, right? The survival brain. Did you know that there is a fourth? There's another one. I like to think about it like sheep herders. Your job is to herd sheep. And if someone comes, let's say a wolf comes to eat those sheep, you can fight it, get your big staff and fight the wolf away. You can realize I've never fought a wolf before and you just freeze. Or what's the third one? Run away. Now there's a fourth, annihilate. I will kill every wolf that has ever existed on this planet. This is something that happens to us and there's no logic there. And for me, I think that's the most important piece when I'm thinking about levels of the brain. A lot of times we do things and we say, that makes no sense. Why did you do that? Or why did I do that? It didn't make any sense. And that's the key. It doesn't make sense because this is not the logical part of your brain. Move up a little bit further, you see the amygdala. This is your emotions, this is your fear. It's attached to the hippocampus, which is in charge of memory. You know what's interesting about both of these? There's also no logic. Think about this. You have a memory center connected to emotions and fear, and there's no logic there. That's a big important piece when we're thinking about why we do what we do. I remember this felt good, like that first time I had that ice cream bar. Felt great. Because when you eat sugar, it releases dopamine. Dopamine makes you get up. It makes you go, and it makes you feel good. Salt and fat makes you release serotonin. And serotonin is kind of like your mother giving you a big hug, saying everything's OK. Both of those are awesome. The first time you had that ice cream bar, you felt all of these things at once, and your amygdala remembered. The problem is the amygdala keeps telling you, do it again, do it again. Come on, one more time but you never feel as good as that first time that you try it. Again, you keep doing it because there's no logic there. The hippocampus is beautiful because it's a bridge to finally your logical brain, which is a prefrontal cortex. However, the hippocampus also absorbs cortisol. 
When is cortisol released? When you stress. Can you absorb cortisol indefinitely? Unfortunately not. So it starts to shrink, which means you have less and less logical thoughts and logical reactions. Something else that happens here is when you keep releasing this cortisol, it leads to more inflammation, which means that more and more lanes in your highway are getting closed, which means mood disorders. Does that make sense? It's causing a lot of problems in our body, one of which is some of these babies aren't even making it. They are dying at conception. Any ideas which groups are dying at the highest rates in this country? What was it? Low income, people of color, black and brown, close. Black and indigenous babies are dying at the highest rate. These are older numbers, it's actually getting worse. Black and indigenous babies and many times the mothers as well are dying at an alarming rate. It's getting terrifying at this point. If you look on the bottom, this is showing smokers. And if you notice, black and indigenous mothers are not the largest smokers, and yet still the babies and they themselves are dying at a much higher rate. Am I saying that smoking is good for you? No. But I'm saying that stress is a lot worse. If we are not dealing with stress, if we are not dealing with inflammation, what are we doing? When you look at a lot of practitioners when someone has gut issues, let's say celiac disease, Celiac disease means that your body has a hard time processing what? Gluten. Lactose intolerance, how about that one? Dairy, right? So when we look at people dealing with those issues, we don't just give them probiotics. We take out the thing causing more inflammation. One of the difficult pieces is what happens when it's your life that's causing the inflammation. That's why I say it's important that we don't just do one thing at a time. It cannot just be probiotics. That cannot just be your therapy. Understand that this is just one of the many modalities. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. The other piece is I say this, I keep saying this often today, every probiotic is different. There's actually a group of probiotics called psychobiotics. If your specific issue is a mind or mood disorder, you don't need just any form of probiotics. Specifically, psychobiotics are the ones that helps. Just to tell you how to get some of these if you don't want to take pills, though you can take capsules for these, and I'll tell you how at the end, just so you know how to get some of these. Lactobacillus fermentum is found in sourdough bread. Bifidobacteria um, lactis is found in raw cheese. I am not a fan of cheese. If y'all don't mind cheese. By all means, get some organic grass-fed cheese. By the way, if you're a person who does okay with dairy, organic is not as important as grass-fed. Because if your cow is eating organic soy and corn, did their indigenous ancestors eat soy and corn? What did cow's ancestors eat? Grass. So that means even your organic dairy is full of inflammation. And what is causing all of our problems? Chronic inflammation. So, so grass-fed is the way to go. Um, in this case, it's specifically raw because when you cook these things, you are killing the bugs inside. Speaking of, we talk about yogurt. Someone recently brought up um, Yo Play yogurt to my, to my class. I told you that the negative bacteria or the not so great bacteria feeds off of yeast and what? Sugar. One cup of Yoplait yogurt has 26 grams of sugar, five grams of protein. It's rough. The other piece is that it is pasteurized. What does that mean if you pasteurize your dairy? You just killed all the probiotics. So you put in a whole bunch of dead Clark Kent's with machine guns. You're like, come on, negative bacteria, take over. It's your turn now. As opposed to something like plain Greek yogurt, which has 23 to 27 grams of protein and only five grams of sugar, depending on which one you get. Another store that I do not work for, Costco, they have their Kirkland brand, 23 grams of protein, seven grams of sugar. Uh, it's natural sugar, it's lactose. Most people who struggle with lactose is not because of the lactose itself, it's the fact that we cooked all of the digestive enzymes out of it. We cooked all the probiotics out of it. We cooked all of the vitamins out of it, put in fake vitamins, 
crossed our fingers and said, good luck. And then we said, see, you're not supposed to drink milk. Our ancestors drank milk, and they were fine. Why are we struggling? We're drinking too much, and we're drinking milk from sick cows. Does that make sense? And then we're cooking all the good benefits out of it. It's rough. Um, the, the last piece is, you see the last thing on here is called inulin. See how short that word is? It's because it's not a probiotic, it is a prebiotic. Inulin is found in things like chicory root, dandelion greens, and sunchoke. So something that you can do is just have a quick sunchoke hash, fried up with a good quality oil, onions, mushrooms. We're going to talk a lot about mushrooms soon. Throw in some dandelion greens. Another reason I like dandelion greens is because herbs, natural herbs, are actually natural digestive enzymes. So if you're not breaking apart your food, you are full of inflammation. What's an easy way to break apart your food? Throw in some fresh herbs and whatever you're eating. I just had a hamburger recently. Throw in some arugula. It was great. It cost me $9 to feed four people. Grass-fed beef and arugula, as opposed to $9 for just a burger of conventional beef if I go out to a restaurant. Does that make sense? The question is, like, what are you really paying for at this point? So this, what I'm showing you here, is basically showing what happens when the freeway is actually open. The freeway is working great. You stress a little bit. You release a little bit of cortisol. The body is still fine. And then you stop. It's OK to release adrenaline. It's OK to release cortisol. It's OK to release insulin. Anything natural is OK. It's when it becomes chronic that we're in trouble. If you notice on the, on the bottom with the adrenal gland, we see adrenaline and cortisol. You see this piece here? Unfortunately, when you release adrenaline, your immune system shuts down. We now know that things like schizophrenia is completely mediated with the microglia, which is the immune system in the brain. So if you are constantly stressed, that means that you constantly have a disrupted immune system. So we have to find a way to, to stop this stress cycle because it's leading to issues that we didn't even know we had and we're making it worse, we're exacerbating the issue. The beautiful piece here, though, is how do we open up a freeway? How do we get someone to actually do their job? Uh, we have people who have been doing work on our streets right by my house, literally by my house. They've been there for at least a month and a half. And it seems like they're making barely any headway on our streets. And I'm trying to figure out, why aren't you working more? Fix our streets. So the question is, how do we fix this highway? And it's with those specific psychobiotics. But the last piece is what's called postbiotics. Have you all ever heard of postbiotics? This is the awesome part that comes afterwards. You're taking care of your inflammation. You have prebiotics. You have probiotics together at the same time. Here are some of the great benefits that come. One of those things is called galanin. The other is called GABA. Galanin is beautiful because galanin helps to go up specifically to the brain and repair some of the damage whereas GABA is associated with contentment. I feel fine, I feel okay. I don't feel so stressed all the time. GABA and galanin. So that's the cool part about psychobiotics. Not only are they opening up your freeway, but they're bringing friends along with them. Let's make it even more beautiful. Let's make it even more safe. There's one last piece that happens in your brain that makes you happy. If you've never heard of BDNF, I invite you to write this down or take a picture. People with high levels of BDNF are typically happy, optimistic. People with little to no BDNF, sad, depressed, suicidal. This is across the board, regardless of ethnicity, how much money you have, BDNF. Now, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, can be increased a lot of different ways. But one of those ways is anti-inflammatory because no matter how much BDNF you have, it has to make it to the happy center of your brain. That's right below the, uh, the amygdala that I showed you earlier today. Right below the amygdala is where you need this BDNF to get, but you can't get there if you have inflammation. So if you notice, you see the very last point I have here? 
turmeric. There's something called NRF2. Think of this like when you're driving and there's always a little back ways that you go. All the locals know the back ways to drive. This is the NRF2 pathway. It's going in a back way to help open up these freeways again. It's cheating the system. One of the ways to cheat the system is to have turmeric. However, turmeric is something called lipophilic. Have you all ever heard the term lipophilic? What are lipids? Fats. Then why do we call it fats? This happened around the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. We switched it from lipids to fats because the sugar industry heard early on that too much sugar leads to obesity and diabetes, erectile dysfunction, neuropathy, and unfortunately, type 3 diabetes, AKA Alzheimer's disease. They already knew this. It was sugar that was, in, that was in trouble. Sugar was in charge of this, not fat. So instead of helping us, they changed the word from lipids to fats. Fats are not the enemy, but we'll talk more about fats later. Turmeric is lipophilic, meaning your body literally cannot absorb it without fat. It's like vitamins A, D, E, and K. Those are fat-soluble vitamins, same with turmeric. So a lot of times you see people drinking turmeric tea, you are literally peeing away your money, literally and physically, <laughs> figuratively. So make sure you have it with some form of fat. How, how do Indians have it when you see them drinking it? Golden milk. Now, golden milk does not have low-fat or non-fat milk. It is full fat. It is kefir or is coconut milk, all of which are full of fat. Now, a lot of people say, well, you need bioprene. Bioprene is one of the active ingredients in black pepper. But it doesn't matter how much bioprene you have if you do not have fat. It's like giving someone a key to a safe. Well, you can't even make it to the safe. You need someone to open the door for you so you can get to the safe. So yes, black pepper or any form of pepper, red pepper, pink pepper, white pepper, green pepper, they're all great for the body. They help you absorb turmeric better. However, you need some form of fat. I'll give you all another for instance. I did this last night. Marinated my chicken with full fat yogurt and turmeric. My chicken has fat, yogurt has fat. You cook it, once you're done cooking it, you have a delicious meal. My kids didn't even know there's turmeric on it. They had the anti-inflammatory capabilities, but they had no idea it was there. So I invite you to find different new fun ways to incorporate turmeric into your daily routine. Another one is we can increase it with exercise. Did you notice in the video that I played, it says one of the ways to help is exercise, and it shows someone riding a bike? Now, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm a huge fan of strength training, lifting heavy weights. I love lifting heavy weights. It's the best thing for diabetes, type 2 and type 3. However, if you want to release BDNF, the best thing is cardiovascular training. So two things that you can do is more cardio, find something that doesn't hurt your joints, your muscles, your bones, and then have some turmeric afterwards. Maybe have a protein shake, throw some turmeric inside, shake it up so you can't see it, and just chug it down. One last thing that I did want to say is that it is suppressed by cortisol and dysbiosis, which are tied hand in hand. I want to talk today about dysbiosis because dysbiosis is the opposite of what we are trying to do. Have you all ever heard this term in uh, IBS or IBD? Inflammatory bowel disease or syndrome? If you are diagnosed with IBS, this is your doctor's way of saying, I have no idea what's wrong with you. Good luck. <laughs> Let's try a bunch of different things to see what happens. A bunch of different therapies. This can occur with dysbiosis. And dysbiosis is, again, the opposite of balance, the opposite of homeostasis. We need to do something called allostasis to switch this. So what can we do? Limit plastics. This is something called a xenoestrogen. Plastics and aluminum foil are xenoestrogens. You have three forms of estrogen in your body, E1, E2, E3, positive, neutral, negative. Peri and postmenopausal women only have one of them. Any idea which? E3, the negative. And it cycles in the body, and it's almost impossible to get it out. There are ways to help eliminate some of this E3, one of which is cruciferous veggies. Y'all know cruciferous veggies? 
broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts. Beautiful. Y'all, y'all do know bok choy. These are things that help. Flax is another. It attaches to that negative estrogen and pulls it out of your body. Here's the problem. If you are cooking your vegetables in aluminum foil and plastic, guess what you just re-put back into your body? Xenoestrogens, which destroys the gut. Remember, the gut is from here all the way down, right? So finding a way to limit them. Hopefully, you noticed that I did put here limit, not take away completely. Because if you do everything that I listed here, this will not be a pendulum shift. This will be a pendulum swing. And it's just a matter of time before you give up. I will say that this has been about a 12-year journey for me of shifting most of these things in my life. I always knew about them. I studied them. I spoke about them. But changing it for myself on a regular basis, it's been about 12 years. And one of the first things that I did was got rid of as much plastic as possible. That was the first step. Once that was my norm, then I did something else. So I'm asking you to take baby steps. This is the, that incremental change we talked about. What do you feel ready, willing, and able to do for your body? And it has to be all three. Ready, willing, and able. If you're all three, then you can make this change. Collagen, we're going to talk a little bit about later. Actually, let me tell you about collagen right now. The difficult piece about the gut is your gut is actually held in, starting here, the esophagus, all the way down. And most of your gut microbiome is in the intestines, the small and large intestines. About 90% of your microbiome is actually in your large intestines. The question is, what happens when you have leaks in your intestines? Does it matter how many probiotics you're putting in? Doesn't matter how many prebiotics you're putting in. You can drink kombucha all day long. By the way, you do not need this entire bottle in one day. If you notice, I still have half left. More is not always better. Doesn't matter how much kombucha you are drinking if you have microscopic holes and leaks in your gut. So the question is, how do we seal it up? How do we make it strong again so you have a good base? And the answer is collagen. I love the idea of collagen powder because you can't taste it. I put it in my coffee. I put it in my water. Uh, some people say they tried collagen and they saw no effect. People who use collagen powder once a day are people who are generally already healthy and they're trying to maintain their health. So the question is, if you only started recently using collagen, that means that you don't have enough. So there's something called the collagen loading phase. You can do it two or three times a day for about a month, maybe two, and then you can go down to once a day. So how else can you get collagen? How do our ancestors get collagen? Bone broth. Who said that? Good job. Bone broth. Put the entire animal in the water and let it cook all day long. It's one of the easiest ways to do this. I've been doing it by accident. We buy full chickens from Costco. I don't really want to cut it up all the time, throw it in some water, and by I, I mean my wife. <laughs> throw it in some water and let it cook all day long. There's your chicken broth, right? Find clever ways to get these things into your body so your body can heal, and it doesn't feel so difficult for you, so much of a struggle for your body. We want to make this as little struggle as possible. So here we go. I, I told you all that it has to be different for every single person. You have to go based on what makes the most sense and what works for you. Apparently, healthy means you don't know of any other issues going on in your body. It doesn't seem like there's anything else, but you want to be healthy, you want to stay healthy, maybe get a little bit more healthy. The first thing I have on here is saprotropic nutrition. This means getting your food from the soil because the soil is full of bacteria. This is where our ancestors got their probiotics from. I used to think they were getting it from things like kimchi and sauerkraut. How about before those groups of people who thought to make kimchi and sauerkraut? They're getting it directly from the soil. So the question then becomes, what happens when your soil is infected? A lot of our soil has bad, bad, bad ingredients, toxins, and chemicals inside. So I invite you to remediate your soil. Switch it out. Put in some good, healthy soil and feed it some beautiful compost. That's my invitation. I can't tell you all what to do. The other piece with saprotropic nutrition is that it comes from bacteria, like, or it comes from fungi, mushrooms. When's the last time you ate with mushrooms and didn't just take off the stem? You didn't just eat the fruit on top. Many times when we cook mushrooms, we just throw the stem away. 
Well, guess what the stem is full of? Nutrients, digestive enzymes, and probiotics. Resistant starch, these are specific things like the jicama that I showed you before. Jicama is a good one. A really random one is cooked and cooled potatoes. Y'all have any idea? Have you ever had cooked and cooled potatoes? Where? Potato salad. Let's just make sure you have an organic mayo to go along with it. I'm going to throw out my organics every once in a while with y'all. Resistant starch is great. This is one of those things that you want to make sure as much as possible to look up. How can you get more resistant starch into your body? I told you that there was two forms of probiotics that I wanted to really elevate and uplift. Number one, bifidobacteria breve. Number two, right here, lactobacillus rhamnosus. Lactobacillus rhamnosus is in charge of anti-inflammation, mood disorders, it's good for diabetes, it's good for weight management. There's a cohort of men and women who were giving lactobacillus rhamnosus for, I believe it was six months. Every single person there lost weight. Every single person in this cohort lost weight. So it's one of those things that's great for everything. Naturally increasing BDNF is another one. What are you going to do to increase this BDNF? If exercise is not for you, then I invite you to go to the Food Network and find fun ways to add more turmeric to your food. But you want to make sure that you cook that turmeric with what? Fat first, fat for a second. Awesome. Y'all are paying attention. Here's another one. Fibromyalgia, Crohn's, colitis, IBS could be here as well. You see the first point here? They actually need less fiber because that fiber goes in and rubs and grains on your intestines. It is not fun. Ask any person who has any of these illnesses or disorders. What does it feel like when you eat things like broccoli, kale, all the things that we tell you you should be eating? It is horrible for them. So we actually ask that they go on a low fiber diet for a while. This is something that you want to make sure you're doing with a healthcare professional, like a registered dietitian. There are some exceptions. I told you about acacia. Acacia is one of those amazing, beautiful fibers and prebiotics that doesn't hurt your intestines, even for pe most people with these conditions. Omega-3. There are many forms of omegas. I hear a lot of people say, had a lot of inflammation, had a lot of issues, I tried some omegas and it didn't work. There's omega-3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. That's a lot. And even within those, there's multiple forms. There's ALA, DHA, and EPA. ALA is an omega-3 that opens up your blood vessels. So if you are a person who's taking omega-3s, but it's mostly ALA, that might not be what you're using it for. DHA is for your brain and your eyes. Well, what if you want it for inflammation? Inflammation is specifically EPA. So the next time you go to get an omega and you say, I need omegas for inflammation, you want to make sure it's omega-3, and it is specifically, mostly EPA. Otherwise, you know why your omega supplement isn't working. It's not that the supplement's not working, you're just using the wrong one. Make sense? Smoking cessation, alcohol is another one of those things. If you keep exacerbating the issue, you can't expect these amazing probiotics to help and do their job properly. On the bottom, I have bacterial vaginitis and candida overgrowth. Candida is saying you have too much what? Yeast. Here's the problem. Guess what one of the first ingredients in your kombucha is? Yeast. If you're a person with chronic yeast infections, you want to make sure you're not putting a lot of yeast in your body, even stuff like kombucha, even sourdough bread. You take away the issue first before you start reintroducing good things inside. Cranberry and garlic is great. I'm not talking about cranberry juice. I think, I forget which brand it was, but cranberries was the second to last ingredient. If you're doing cranberries, eat an actual cranberry or take cranberry capsules. I don't know if you've ever drank straight 100% cranberry juice before. It's not a lot of fun. It's rough. And then again, of course, less sugar and yeast, which is easier said than done. 
Here we have obesity and type 2 diabetes. Firmicus and Kristen, Kristen Sinella, this is just another way of saying, get your hands dirty. Let's find a way to make your own garden. If you can't have a garden, how about a big planter? Put your hands in there and eat this food yourself. Get some good soil. Make sure that it's good quality. Grow your food, take it out, eat it. You don't have to wash away all of the dirt. Have you ever just seen a beautiful cherry tomato that you pick? You just have to bite into it. You don't always wash it, right? This is an easy way to get some good bacteria back into the body. Microbe diversity. Let's find a way to not just do the same thing all the time. If you're a person who just does kombucha, that's your bag. Every time I have probiotics is from kombucha, I invite you to try something new. Maybe miso is something you can start trying. You ever had miso soup before? Maybe miso could be good, um, soy sauce. Fructose is one of the difficult ones because fructose comes from what? Fruit. So the question then is, did our ancestors eat fruit? Yes. They typically ate fruit when? When it was in season, first and foremost, thank you for saying that. What's the other piece? When they were done doing work. They were working the field all day long. They would kill an elk and carry it back six miles. You know how heavy an elk is? Six miles, they would carry it back when they got home. Thank you. Here's your banana. Here's your watermelon. Here's your pineapple. As opposed to, I'm bored. I think I'm going to have a big bowl of fruit. Too much fructose is the main reason we have diabetes. I'm going to say that again. Too much fruit is the main reason we have diabetes. Did our ancestors drink juice? Can you think of one group of people who drank juice? We do today. We actually have an epidemic of ob childhood obesity and diabetes. I believe the last numbers that I read was that 60% of our kids from the age of 7 to 16 are overweight and another 17% are in the obese category. Besides the fact that they're not playing outside as much and they're on their phones a lot, right? The other piece is that they're drinking a lot of juice. This is hand to mouth. When you first come out of the womb, you cry. So you soothe yourself with a nipple or a bottle. Then they give you a pacifier. Then they give you juice and it just never stops. Later on, we pick up cigarettes, right? Hand to mouth is a way that we're soothing ourselves and we need to find a new way besides something like fructose. Is fruit bad for you? No. Let you be cognizant of when we're consuming fruit. Is that fair? Y'all not, not going to leave here today and say, Ronaldo said I can't have fruit ever again? Awesome. Maybe. <laughs> this looks like a lot, right? I'm going to make this easy for y'all. Whenever you see red dots, that's good. Green dots are bad. This is the brain and the gut microbiome, specifically the microglia that I spoke about for a person with schizophrenia. You see number three on this list. Here's that word again for the third time today. Bifidobacterium breve. It was the specific bacteria that was given to people with schizophrenia and the one that they saw the most help with consistently across the board. Bifidobacterium breve specifically. Limiting dairy intake. I'm not against dairy. Y'all heard me say this already. I'm a big fan of dairy. And in fact, I have dairy multiple times every day. I also don't have schizophrenia. I also don't have an issue breaking apart lactose in my body. If I did, I would take it out. The first thing that we ask you do, stop taking dairy. Actually, here, I shouldn't even put limit. I should say eliminate dairy until the issue um, corrects itself. Specifically, psychobiotics. You don't need random probiotics. Um, when you have mushrooms, we've been eating something called hot pot with a friend of mine. She is from... Hong Kong, and she's introduced us to so many species of mushrooms. I had no idea they existed. It's been really beautiful. The more forms of mushrooms, and again, the stem as well, the better for the gut. And then the last piece here that I wanted to say is vitamin B6. I wanted to point this out because I'm asking that you don't go and buy a, buy a vitamin B6 capsule, because I promise you it will be synthetic 
and your body has no idea how to break it apart. Unless you are specifically getting a food-based B vitamin. Another company I don't work for, Garden of Life. They use raw, whole, organic, non-GMO, vegan food for their vitamins. If you're going to get a B vitamin, maybe get something like that, as opposed to just a regular pill. Also, B6 can be found in salmon, tuna, eggs, chicken livers. I'm sure y'all love chicken livers, right? <laughs> Carrots, spinach, green peas, chickpeas, and avocado. So just throw those in your, your diet more often, and you should be okay. I know I'm running out of time. So I want to end with a couple of different things. The first is you see on the very bottom, I say culturally appropriate trauma-informed spaces therapy ceremony. Now this is big because nowadays we have a lot of culture vultures. Y'all heard this term before? When we, go to, when we go to ceremony, we are going there to heal from a specific event. The whole point of going to ceremony is to heal. And when we're not healing, this is when we have more inflammation. You remember I told you that black and indigenous people are the ones dying at the highest rate. So when you go to a cultural practice that is not yours, I'm asking you to ask permission. If someone says no, please honor and respect that. It's like going to a survivor's meeting for women who are survivors of domestic violence from men. And you say, I'm a man, but I'm not like them. Just let me in. Why can't I just come? Does that make sense? We have to honor the spaces that we're in. So if you go to a space, ask, are they trying to heal from someone who looks just like me? Because if so, are they able to heal? We have to make sure that we're not so selfish that we instill ourselves in places that we're not meant to be until we are invited. Is that fair? Another piece is father's health. I feel like so often when we do these talks, we focus so much on the mother. What did you do? What did you do wrong? Why did this baby come out this way? Fortunately for you all, most of the time it's not women, it's men. It's our sperm quality. So one of the things you can also do is when you have your health questionnaire, when you're trying to figure out if you want to date a guy or not, <laughs> what are you doing to nurture your gut? <laughs> Give me one of your first questions. Capsules versus food. This is rough because many times capsules, as they're going down your digestive tract, is very hot. That's why it's very strange for me when people say don't take coconut oil because it'll harden your arteries. My question is how? You know how hot it is inside of your body? The other problem with that, though, is when you're taking probiotic capsules, they're waking up, they're dying, they're being killed on the way down, so they don't even make it. So I'm not a big fan of capsules unless they have both pro and prebiotics. And I'm telling you now, most of them don't. Another thing you can do is just make sure that every time you take it, you take it with food and you have some form of prebiotic. Maybe you can always take your capsules with some jicama or something like that. Hydrocolonics is big because hydrocolonics is coming in. Where did I say 90% of your bacteria is? The colon, right? How about we just take it out and start over again? The problem with most colonics is that they use force and they suck and it damages the colon. Whereas hydrocolonics uses warm water. It's beautiful. Seeing people after they're done with hydro hydrocolonics, it's like nothing ever happened to them. And the last piece is mind-body modalities. I'm so happy we got to learn about EFT today. We've heard about Reiki and massage a lot, but EFT is one of those we don't hear about often. I love mind-body modalities because it allows you to be. It's one of our senses. We have 13 senses, and one of those senses was to be. If you were able to just be for a while, you don't have to stress. So allowing someone who is certified in this, someone who is a specialist in this, to come in and help you be so that you can open up those highways again, I think it's one of the most beautiful, amazing, awesome things that you can do for your bodies. I really want to uplift the practitioners who do these mind-body modalities as much as possible because I can't emphasize enough the importance of them so that the probiotics can do their work. So to end this all, I want to ask you, how will you nurture your gut? And one last thing I want to say is this. Everything that y'all do, it doesn't matter what you are doing, you are feeding your health, 
You're either going to feed your health or your disease. So y'all coming here, knowing that traffic is going to be horrible right now, you are feeding your health. I think it's beautiful. I love seeing y'all here taking care of yourselves. So thank you so much for letting me be a part of your journey. <laughs>